Now, it's a pleasure to, to be with you this morning. I, I confess that as the opportunity for doing this interview first presented itself, uh, it gave me a chance to, to start reflecting on the fact that you and I first met almost to the day 40 years ago. And as I thought about it and began to think about the remarkable career that you've had, um, it's, it's just been a very satisfying experience. Now, why don't we begin by, by your summarizing or, or telling me about those achievements that, uh, that you feel have been the most important for your career? Well, let me say first uh, how pleased I am to have this uh, interaction with one of my outstanding graduate students <laughs> at MIT who obtained his PhD after uh, his uh, MD and became very influential. Um, to list them is a little difficult, but I'll, I'll try to go through quite rapidly. Uh, the first was the establishment of the uh, uh, Institute of Nutrition of Central America in Panama uh, in Guatemala. Mm -hmm. The uh, next would be the um, uh, Department of Nutrition and Food Science at MIT, and uh, two sub-programs in that, the International Nutrition Program, and uh, a project that's not as well known on, uh, on single cell protein. Uh, from that, all sorts of things started happening. Uh, one is I was invited to uh, start the World Hunger Program at the United Nations University, and uh, not only did that, but uh, continued actually 20 years uh, uh, working uh, uh, with it. Uh, the, uh, I started the International Nutrition Foundation, which uh, is, still, uh, is still continuing. Uh, I, the uh, Committee on Nutrition and Infection of the Food and Nutrition Board. Uh, and then sp some specific uh, topical things, of which probably the most important is the work on nutrition and infection. You know, that, that to me is, is one of the most important um, relationships uh, of, the, of the 20th century that, uh, that was described um, in, in sufficient detail to have enormous impact, not only on infections, but a, a whole variety of, of health issues related to nutrition, how did that how did that relationship first become um, well evident to you? I mean, is that something that that you discovered serendipitously, or was it the work at INCAP or before INCAP? When I, when I uh, got to Guatemala and our work with INCAP began, okay. <clears throat> there were a lot of severely malnourished children uh, in the uh, villages, and. Uh, we start. It. I, after I'd been at uh, INCAP less than a year, I represented uh, WHO uh, in pa in PAHO, Pan American Health Organization, uh, at the second meeting of the FAO, joint FAO WHO expert committee, and at that meeting, Brock, uh, John Brock of South Africa and Marcel Autre of FAO uh, had gone on a trip through Africa to see what this report of this disease uh, unknown as Red Boy and some and uh, various, various names. And they uh, came back and gave their own report to the committee. Mm -hmm. And uh, first of all, it, it was evident that, th that this was a uh, widespread problem in, in Africa. Uh, secondly, that it had been well described by Cicely Williams yes. in 1933 and the bit, uh, 38 and had been uh, uh, ignored. And uh, I, I recognized that I'd seen cases in Panama and already seen <coughs> cases in Guatemala. And WHO gave me uh, a grant that I could use to hire a physician to explore this. And the FAO sent Otre back 
So it was the Moises Bear uh, Outre report on uh, Quachiorcor in Central America. Actually, uh, it had been previously described by uh, uh, Martin Galo in uh, Chile, but never known outside of uh, Chile. But he had used the uh, name Syndrome Pluricanensial de la Infancia. And uh, we, uh, his, the, the uh, uh, Bear Otre report had that name, but it never stuck. <laughs> uh, it, it very soon. And then um, they, um, WHO sent uh, Waterloo to Brazil, and he described the same thing there. Uh, then it was apparent that this was a worldwide phenomenon in uh, developing countries. So that was... Uh, and, and, and the relationship of, that, of those observations and their link to infection? Well, the point is that we soon realized that nearly, uh, well, not nearly, all of our cases of Kwashiorkor had been precipitated by a previous episode of diarrheal disease mm -hmm. or repeated episodes of diarrheal disease, respiratory disease. We documented it uh, precipitated by measles, by, chick by uh, uh, chickenpox, uh, and uh, whooping cough. And it was, it was very apparent. Uh, and so we started with focused research on that. I started uh, writing about it. But the interesting thing is, at that time, uh, uh, there was Jolliffe's Textbook of Nutrition. It was a thick text. And uh, if you looked at the index, there was um, one reference to nutrition. I looked it up. And uh, it said there's uh, uh, no evidence for a relationship between nutrition and infection, except possibly for tuberculosis. Yes. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, then, the, interestingly enough, I gave seminars at Harvard and uh, in uh, India, and uh, there was great skepticism. And uh, that motivated me to uh, not go beyond our own research and let's see what was in the literature. Mm -hmm. And about that time, I came up to the Harvard School of Public Health. John Gordon was just retiring as the head of the uh, uh, epidemiology department and uh, got, was, got interested in it from my talking about it and so on. He was the editor and he asked me to write a paper uh, for the section that he edited. And uh, he became a co-author on that paper, I believe. But at any rate, uh, uh, that was the first start. And surprisingly enough, that paper uh, was, became very influential. It was one of the most cited uh, uh, papers. Uh, of the time, and that led to the invitation, and that had about 600 references. Mm -hmm. and that led to the invitation by WHO to write a monograph uh, on nutrition infection, and ultimately we did, and that, that had a, uh, almost a thousand references, uh, supporting, by and large, uh, our, uh, our, I would say more than the hypothesis, our conclusion. Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, infection, and then, of course, we started looking at the effect of nutrition on something besides uh, kwashiorkor, on vitamin A deficiency, uh, uh, particularly on iron deficiency. But writing the monograph was, was not easy because we wrote every word of it. And uh, Gordon, uh, well, one of the things that helped um, in working with the, the WHO FAO committees, I usually represented WHO. And the head of the nutrition division uh, of uh, FAO is uh, uh, 
uh, Wallace Akeroyd. And uh, Wallace was uh, really a superb writer and editor, an Englishman. And he had done original studies in, of nutrition and on vitamin A deficiency in Newfoundland. But uh, we toiled over and argued over uh, wording and so on. And uh, I learned a lot about writing from him. But uh, John Gordon was uh, even more amazing. Uh, and uh, when he had us uh, edit the article, it was the American Medical uh, Journal of Medical Sciences. Uh, he kept short getting words and cutting words out. And I uh, felt it was the longest telegram <laughs> in the world, ever written. Yeah. But at any rate, uh, that that's uh, has helped me. Uh, now, since I've written six hundred scientific articles and ten, uh, edited ten books and written three mo three of them, but uh, uh, so that that's an episode. Among your many achievements, I mean, there 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 are three that at least many people uh, refer to most often in, in my experience. Certainly, nutrition and infection is one. In Caparina, uh, and the the types of formulations that it enabled after that is the second. The third is the whole potassium iodate uh, story with, with uh, um, iodine deficiency and goiter. Uh, did that play as big a role in your mind? Is it, uh, um, well, uh, there was iodization of salt in Switzerland and the United right. States uh, at the time. It was voluntary in the United States and it was compulsory in certain cantons in, uh, in Switzerland. Um, we started seeing uh, in the villages uh, large uh, visible and uh, almost everyone had in some villages had palpable uh, goiter, endemic goiter. Mm -hmm. Well in uh, the 1920s, uh, Maureen and Kimball had done a trial of uh, iodation, uh, of, uh, iodization of salt uh, in uh, Ohio and uh, Michigan. That was before the U.S. adopted its policy. And uh, they had, did it with potassium iodide and did it with refined salt that had been cleaned and dried and stabilizing chemical and so on. Very, very successful. A significant part of, of your career was spent paying attention to iron and uh, iron metabolism and, and the role that iron supplementation could play uh, not only in health but in work productivity. Uh, well, this, there was a period of uh, my intense interest in the problem and in convening committees, meetings, speaking uh, uh, on this subject. It became apparent best in the work of Betsy Losoff mm -hmm. uh, at, from um, uh, Michigan State, uh, who, and also Pollitt. Yeah, that's the uh, Pollitt. Pollitt right. is the one who uh, saw the animal work and wanted to uh, uh, do the um, uh, wanted to apply this to children. I met him at the UN Social Science uh, uh, Institute in Geneva, and uh, hired him or, as a professor uh, at uh, at MIT. Got the funds for him, and uh, he um, then. Uh, got a group of what were supposedly poor children and uh, uh, gave them uh, iron and he expected an increase uh, and uh, uh, he got it. And then, but this, we didn't think that iron deficiency was enough that it would be influencing cognitive behavior. But it was. Mm -hmm. and then he went down to go, oh, and it, re it reversed with treatment. Then he went down to Guatemala 
and he was working now with more severe anemia, it didn't reverse the tra treatment. Betsy Lozoff came in uh, working with infants uh, and f found the, the same thing. And then she went to Costa Rica and uh, set up a study. And again, clearly, the uh, infants who were iron deficient uh, also had a uh, decrease in the Bailey score test for mental development and, uh, and other tests. Uh, the, you gave them iron, the hemoglobin came right back to normal, but the intellectual deficit uh, persisted. Well, she was able to follow these, uh, the, uh, she was able then to study a group of children uh, in Colombia and also follow these, where uh, one year and two years and five years, finally 10 years, and even though they didn't have an anemia, again, anemia at this critical period in infancy and childhood yeah. uh, did have a permanent effect, and we realized it. Then uh, I started looking at the uh, iron content of uh, breast milk and when the child needs to have some other source of iron, and given the diets, it was quite clear what was happening. So I became, I became a crusader mm -hmm. for the uh, uh, iron supplementation as part of the uh, as part of the feeding after breast milk was no longer sufficient as mm -hmm. the sole source of food. Um, I think you'll recall that we uh, were offered funds to uh, visit re the consider the uh, the WHO guidelines to uh, add this component. Well, the WABA, which is a World uh, Association of Breastfeeding and so on, got the idea that this threatened the code. And uh, I got threatening letters. Yes. And I think you did too. Uh, well, you know, the, uh, the, the connection with iron and maternal and infant health is very strong and, and continues to get quite a bit of attention, as, as you've said, uh, despite uh, the controversies such as the one with well, Lamba. Well, I haven't talked much about the field studies. Yeah. But, <clears throat> but yeah, uh, I was going to get to Samir Basta, for example, and, and the work that he well, did. Well, let me... Uh, and, uh, I'm, the um, Ford Foundation mm -hmm. is willing to uh, provide uh, funds to uh, study iron deficiency in, in, in um, uh, Indonesia. And uh, this is an interesting story too. It was a rubber plantation where the workers were paid uh, by the amount of rubber they collected in a day. Uh, they were uh, uh, we, there was a linear correlation between the uh, rubber correlation, uh, rubber collection, uh, and iron status. Then they were given uh, iron for uh, uh, three months, and the ones who had been anemic or uh, at least iron deficient now came up to the same level, a very significant increase. 20% increase in the amount of rubber uh, that they uh, collected. And then we came to uh, analyze it, and the, there had been a similar increase in the group uh, receiving, supposed to be receiving placebo. Well, it turned out the Ford Foundation had, had lots of money, uh, uh, both the for Representative and Samir Basta, the, um, who uh, was assigned the project, uh, thought they needed uh, some more compensation and gave them uh, a very small supplement that they th thought would, uh, was negligible. And it turned out that this was enough for them to buy 
some green leaves and uh, cassava leaves and other things, and it turned out that that was enough to uh, <laughs> give them uh, yeah. iron, just as we'd given the other group uh, supplementary iron. Well, that, that was the beginning. Um, I did a study in Indonesia and uh, where with, uh, on a tea plantation uh, in near Pananangalingan. Uh, and I also had a iron study simultaneously going in Egypt. So Mary took over responsibility for monitoring and coordinating uh, and also collecting uh, uh, anthropological uh, data along with it. Uh, while I was trying to rescue this, uh, and, it, and it, the field director in Indonesia was very good, uh, Husseini, but uh, the field director in uh, Egypt, who unfortunately was an MIT uh, PhD graduate, uh, was totally incompetent. Mm -hmm. Of course, I knew I should have known that, and uh, I kind of did. But anyway, uh, what came, they, I didn't trust the, uh, that they'd gotten the, I, the two groups straight, supplemented all the time. Mm -hmm. I didn't trust the supervision. But Pollitt uh, ingeniously took the whole population, stratified them for iron status, and showed uh, differences in intellectual capacity of the uh, younger and older children. So it wasn't totally lost. You know, as, we, as I think about it, we've learned an enormous amount about iron and the role that it plays, not only in those critical windows during childhood uh, and in work productivity in, in adulthood, and yet iron deficiency remains the most common nutrient deficiency in the world. Why do you think it's been so difficult uh, to uh, to redress. Well, uh, we tried. Uh, we set up uh, the um, iron deficiency consultative uh, program mm -hmm. to provide data to everyone, all the available data uh, on iron deficiency, and this came about because. Uh, another colleague, Gary Gleason, who's working for UNICEF, uh, was running into uh, technical problems and, about, and had learned about the literature on iron and so on, and wrote me. And I started answering his questions by email. And eventually, uh, that project entity came back to MIT, and we started uh, this IADEN advisor service, which made information available. And that, that's about as far as uh, I was able to carry it. You know, in, uh, in, in, in reflecting on the impact that you've had, um, what were the principles that, that guided your professional and personal choices in a career that, that has spanned over 65 years uh, that has seen itself expressed in uh, scientific advocacy, policy, institution building. I mean, just a, a broad uh, array of, of, of impacts. I wasn't conscious of any basic principles, but trying now analyzing, going back 60 mm -hmm. years, I realized that there were several. One, probably, uh, in part a heritage of my father, who had been gone through an apprenticeship in England and was a, a bricklayer, a mason, a mason, and became an a influential uh, college professor uh, at Marquette University in the United States. But he treated everybody uh, equally, whether it was a janitor, whether it was a, uh, the plumber or whatever, he didn't make a prejudgment mm -hmm. uh, of them. And uh, then um, uh, I had an experience in medical school that I won't detail, uh, but anyway, I 
misunderstood or misinterpreted uh, the action of uh, a, a fourth year student when I was a third year student and uh, built up, it had to do with military drill and the resentment built up and built up and uh, then I was assigned to the same ward where he was a senior medical student and I was the uh, junior and found he was a wonderful guy. He didn't, wasn't any more tied up on the military than I was, and totally unaware that he had uh, uh, upset me somehow and that I, and then I was justified. So I, uh, then I had two other seminal experiences. Uh, there was a um, meeting in uh, Mexico, uh, a Macy round table on protein calorie malnutrition. And as we came in, there was this uh, short, uh, very uh, black fellow. And uh, I guess just subconsciously, I didn't expect uh, him to turn out to be uh, really the leader. This uh, uh, physician from Ghana, Fred Sai, oh, all right. uh, was clearly uh, uh, outstanding. He later became uh, director of International Planned Parenthood, but he did very good work with uh, uh, Kwashiorkor. Another, I was at a meeting in Indonesia and there was this fellow with scraggly hair and uh, brown skin and uh, not particularly well dressed. And uh, again, I, I formed an opinion, which I found when the meeting started, that he was one of the, he was outstanding, one of the key people. And I think those lessons stuck. So that when I went anywhere in any group, uh, I considered the, um, quite possibly my equals or my superiors. And so that's the um, uh, second uh, uh, principle uh, is a little more uh, difficult to define. But uh, again, I think that probably the fact that both my parents were, were teachers influenced it, but I was interested in education and uh, in, in training, in institution building, and not I wasn't going to spend my life only in research. I wanted research, but I wanted to uh, uh, influence the uh, uh, nutrition status of uh, the populations. So in you mentioned uh, a basic principle your dad taught you in terms of, of not judging by appearances, their commitment to, uh, to education. Are there other principles like of well, that magnitude? In, in a... Well, from uh, these uh, first two principles uh, evolved something that uh, I can't explain, but I can recognize. And that is that I can go into any country, any society, and feel comfortable uh, with the people. It doesn't matter what their religion is, or it doesn't matter, it, it's the people. And that uh, I can find leaders among market women or among uh, any, at, at any group. But uh, language has never been a barrier, of course, in Latin America, if, uh, I knew Spanish. English, fortunately, is being uh, by, no, learned by professionals mm -hmm. throughout the developing world. Uh, it made working anywhere a pleasure and an opportunity, and I think probably other people, the other people sensed that I was interested in them and not not myself. Let me backtrack a bit. One of the one of the most impressive aspects of, of the whole in cap experience, at least to an outsider, 
was the remarkable cadre of individuals that, in fact, began to work there when you arrived, well, many of them local. Uh, not many of them. All of them were Central American. All of them. Well, I'm thinking of people like Jean-Pierre Habik and others that came that, that were not. Uh, well, but, uh, this, this, this is worth putting, uh, spending a little bit of time on because um, uh, it's something I didn't mention, a basic principle, but that is to give every, be encouraging, to be mm -hmm. supporting. People may let, may let you down, but give them the opportunity and uh, you'll be amazed at, at the results. And uh, bringing together these licenciados in farmacia uh, from Central, uh, Central America uh, the, and giving them a responsibility. Uh, and anytime any, anybody uh, showed real promise, I'd set up a new division. This might be one person, mm -hmm. but uh, to encourage them. Well, uh, obviously we had to have better trained people. So uh, the, we, we did have uh, one person, Ricardo Bersani, right. who, had a master's, who had a master's degree, and he uh, went back to Purdue, who was the first to get his PhD. Well, the Kellogg Foundation played a very important role in INCAP because it had uh, not only uh, provided a grant of $15,000 to PAHO to cover my salary, a secretary, and travel, <laughs> uh, but it also... That was one five. I want to make sure the audience understands uh, that. <laughs> but it also uh, uh, contributed, uh, uh, had a lump sum mm -hmm. to... to start the library, buy the equipment, and that sort of thing. The government of Guatemala built the uh, building. But the most important thing was that it made a commitment to provide fellowships uh, mm -hmm. for uh, advanced training of, of people. And um, there was uh, uh, someone from the foundation came every year and uh, to see who was ready to go and join the most promise. Guillermo Arriave was the second person to, to go. And uh, the general principle was that as soon as someone became indispensable, uh, they just they were, had a key part of the program, you sacrifice the present for the future. Yeah. And uh, when they, and this followed, uh, Ariavi eventually uh, came back. Then Miguel Guzman mm -hmm. was set up and, uh, uh, and came back. We did have one break in uh, Tahara, who uh, had um, uh, gone through a, he, he had been the chief resident at uh, MGH. Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston in, in pathology. And he was, he was a good leader. Uh, he, be, he became the third director eventually. Oh, how, when did Viteri come to... to uh, oh, uh, well, uh, Fernando came in uh, a little bit later. Um, uh, but uh, he, he had one of the Kellogg Foundation fellowships that sent him to uh, uh, work... Uh, no, it's St. Louis, anyway. And uh, each of these people, Ariavi, Brasani, Guzman, Viteri, uh, were, became world leaders. Yeah. And so how, how did you manage to find such an incredible group of individuals in an area that was um, quite as, as, facing all the difficulties that Central America confronted during that era? I, I can, uh, well, that's pretty easy to explain. Okay. Uh, because, first of all, anybody who came to me and wanted a job, wanted an opportunity, wanted encouragement and so on, uh, I would give an opportunity mm -hmm. to. And uh, uh, as an example, it also applies to the uh, uh, staff, but <clears throat> I, had uh, many physicians 
come to me and wanting to do a research project uh, uh, with me. And um, so I'd say, yes, write up your idea and so on. And uh, about uh, out of uh, the 100%, uh, not uh, uh, 20%, well, more like 10% would actually uh, start writing proposal when they found what was required and mm -hmm. amount of time and so on. Uh, of, uh, of those who started, uh, only half uh, completed any kind of uh, re research at all. Well, we had, we had these uh, licenciados uh, applying mm -hmm. and uh, we gave them a chance. And, uh, there was another. There was another element, and that is, Kellogg Foundation had given fellowships to, um, and offered three fellowships to developing countries: one for nutrition, one in um, uh, and food uh, uh, analysis, and one in uh, uh, medical nutrition, and uh, a. Bob Harris, who was a, a key factor in influencing, he was a professor at MIT, yeah. who was a in factor in influencing uh, uh, the uh, Minister of Health in Guatemala to, to do this. The Minister of Health in Guatemala had learned about uh, a number of institutes for food analysis that the Rockefeller Foundation had started, and he wanted one for Guatemala. And uh, Harris said, no, uh, it's too small a unit. It should be for Central America and concentrating in food science. Uh, food analysis is too limited. You need a broader institute of nutrition. And uh, with that, they brought together the uh, ministers of health of the um, uh, countries, member countries, and uh, the uh, in the concept of an institute of nutrition of uh, Central America Panama was approved, and all country all of five of the countries uh, signed a promise to that had to be ratified, of course. And um, uh, the, then the Kellogg Foundation had supported uh, two of these food analysis. Uh, Institutes, one in Mexico and uh, uh, one in Colombia. And uh, the Harris went to the Kellogg Foundation to get, see if he could get support for this uh, new institute. And so it, it had this support. Now, I haven't been sufficiently complete in saying that some very good people just turned up. One of the best was Susanne Casa, who later sent up a, the first school of, uh, for nutritionists and dietitians uh, in Latin America mm -hmm. after, who had studied and gotten her training with Pedro Escudero in uh, Argentina. Uh, then in the group that was selected uh, by, uh, to have this training with Harris was Ariave and uh, uh, Marina Flores, mm -hmm. and so they, that gave me uh, a couple of people to, to start. Um, it, but there's no question that emphasis on individuals, uh, helping individuals to uh, get uh, better training uh, was a key. Let's fast forward a bit in the sense that from the, from the opportunity at INCAP, soon came another one that you began to, to mention just a few minutes ago in terms of um, MIT. Uh, and, and well, the, M I, MIT... Which I, I would imagine would be the second major opportunity. Well, MIT came 11 years later, and uh, I was offered it by Fred Soper, the uh, director of... Um, uh, what was the Pan American Sanitary Bureau at that time, and 
my wife Mary was uh, very supportive of the idea and it used the, uh, the training that I had. So it, it wasn't a difficult decision for, uh, for us. Uh, but... So how, how did that opportunity come about? I mean, uh, it, was, it, was it primarily through personal relationships, you think? Glenn King, yeah. President of the Nutrition Foundation, had, uh, was a member of the advisory committee of NCAP, impressed with its progress and leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, James Killian, the president of MIT, was the chairman of his board. King was a very, very fine person and, and very influential because of his integrity and unselfishness. And uh, but that's surely, how that came about. But surely, do you, do you think MIT saw a, a larger vision when they asked you to come rather than just trying to help them salvage what was then, in, in, in their estimation at least, not a very strong department in terms of... No, the they, were, it was, they were about to close it. I wish they had closed it before I came <laughs> because I, I had a great deal of trouble uh, with the um, uh, person who had served as acting head and for two years uh, till I could come. And he expected to be, uh, first of all, he resented diluting food science with nutrition. And uh, second, he had, I think, been promised the department head by uh, his, uh, uh, by the former. What was the vision at MIT for bringing food science, nutrition, food technology together beyond the problem they were facing of this, the of this department? The, the vision came... Uh, actually for me. Mm -hmm. uh, I envisaged the same kind of broad, multidisciplinary uh, department that INCAP had uh, developed to be. I remember uh, in negotiating with MIT and the, uh, the dean of science at the time that I wanted to be able to have a clinical research center. Uh, and. Uh, uh, he said, "Well, we'll never have a you'll never have a clinical research center at MIT, but we can. We'll try to find space in MGH for you." There are two offshoots of, of at MIT uh, that I think were particularly important. But I, but I'd like your reaction to see whether you think they were as seminal as I think. One was the IMP program, uh, which was one of the, the earliest efforts to really try to look at nutrition somewhat comprehensively and not domestically, but, but internationally. And the other was a, um, a conference that you organized on cognition and nutrition. Uh, because while people had a, a, an inkling that that was important, um, it seemed to take off after that conference. Are, well, that, were those opportunities that the world came to because of, well, of the MIT one, or is uh, that? This, this is true. Um, the, um, uh, a Russian who was head of um, uh, ECOSOC uh, uh, knew well one of the uh, uh, senior faculty at MIT and uh, was in, we happened to be interested in single cell protein. We, but it wasn't called single cell protein. Uh, it was uh, bacterial or fungal or whatever protein. and. Uh, uh, they were willing to support a con uh, an international conference on this. And we took, sat in my office uh, okay. and put various names on the board. None of them were uh, truly appropriate, but the, uh, the most uh, <coughs> fitted the best was single cell protein and the most neutral. And then we had a, a major international congress uh, one week after the meeting, the articles started appearing with single cell protein. It just, just taken uh, hold incidentally. Well, I'd learned the importance of name from our, from our uh, we haven't talked much about Encaparina, but from the importance of the name for Encaparina, because yeah. it was Encap plus the uh, local uh, Spanish term uh, for <coughs> corn flour. Uh, then uh, the next 
major conference at MIT was the one to which you refer on nutrition, uh, learning, and behavior. That's right. Um, John Gordon helped and was responsible, I think, for broadening the, uh, the title. But the animal nutrition people had been doing some very interesting studies of nutrition uh, on behavior of rats, particularly, and the, of course, there was some, uh, some pretty good clinical work also. They didn't speak to each other, they didn't, there was no relationship. Brought them together, and uh, it was a very successful conference, uh, and uh, we, we got out the conference report as a book, and that was very influential. Uh, and uh, I'm uh, uh, quite proud of, bo of both of those. I want to talk about single cell protein mm -hmm. because, uh, again, I told you the, the uh, importance of the name. But uh, this was a time when all of the large uh, companies, uh, the oil companies and the, uh, also some of the pharmaceutical companies, uh, were uh, interested in the, the protein was foremost at that time and interested in an alternate protein source. And uh, uh, Nestle was the first to come to us and uh, we did a, uh, uh, this was a, a matter of, no, this was a, uh, tolerance trial, an acceptability trial. Uh, I think it was uh, a small amount of um, the uh, of yeast, ordinary brewer's yeast, grown on, grown on glucose, and uh, <clears throat> no problems. And so then we embark, em, em, embarked on a nitrogen balance study, a metabolic study, to look at the uh, nitrogen uh, absorption, the protein value uh, of it. And uh, after two weeks, uh, people started getting rashes, and we had to suspend the trial. And I had a French physician. Jean-Claude uh, Dillon. Jean-Claude Dillon, <laughs> uh, to whom uh, I signed this problem. And he figured it out, that it was a, uh, a low mo a molecular weight uh, uh, polypeptide. And then we set about trying to figure out uh, how to pro well, why the first batch hadn't done it and the second had. Uh, had. And we found that they uh, had done the uh, first batch at, uh, high, at high temperature and the second batch trying to conserve energy or something. Anyway, it had been done at a, a much lower uh, temperature. That raises then your, your role uh, and the opportunities they may have presented to you with all the UN agencies because uh, you've had a, a, a rather, uh, again, I mean, spectacular well, experiences with FAO, WHO, UNICEF, uh, UNDP, uh, UNU. Uh, ECOSOC, ECOSOC that's right. uh, Asian Development Bank, World yeah. Bank, yes. What, what, if, you, if you reflect on, on that group and, and had to distill from that one or two opportunities comparable to the MIT one or the NCAP, were there or is it just too fractured given the nature of, of, of the UN system? Um, a UN system is interesting. We won't get into a discussion <laughs> of it. Uh, today, uh, there's no question that the uh, PAG had some influence, particularly on uh, on WHO, and uh, fulfilled an, an important role. But it was also true that uh, it was disappearing, and uh, energy leaving energy the more important efficiency. So when this new structure was set up, we also uh, set up uh, a subcommittee of it, uh, um, IDEC, Inter uh, International Dietary Energy Consolidated Group. Then we were criticized because we 
were concentrating in one nutrient or something. So it became the uh, uh, pro protein energy group. But mainly through support from the Nestle Foundation, mm -hmm. that had a series of quite remarkable uh, conferences and books, com uh, monographs coming out. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Nestle uh, paid for the printing of these monographs. So we moved from uh, protein emphasis at, at that time to the emphasis on um, energy deficiency. And uh, we uncovered a lot of, of relationship between energy uh, deficiency and uh, uh, cognitive development mm -hmm. and uh, a, n a number of other uh, factors. So have there been opportunities that, that were presented to you that for whatever reason you didn't exploit that in, in retrospect you wish you had uh, because uh, gee, you either didn't recognize the importance or it just didn't work out in a way that you thought would be, uh, would be useful? No, I think that uh, I seized every, every opportunity mm -hmm. and put a number of things simultaneously. No, I don't think I, I lost anything. Mm -hmm. I, one thing flowed, led to another, and uh, was, was very satisfying and uh, very compelling. Yeah. You know, and, um, when, when one thinks about opportunities, accomplishments, uh, generally we don't, we don't get to realize them without support of colleagues, institutions, um, friends, family. Uh, in, in your life, I mean, in, in, in your scientific uh, uh, well, life, I mean, are there, are there Im important support structures or individuals? Uh, beyond the ones that we've talked about. I mean, we, and we haven't really talked about people. Well, if uh, you're going to st strengthen institutions, mm -hmm. uh, you have to build capable personnel. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that's, uh, that's a basic principle. And I seized every possible opportunity to But who are the people that helped you seize, seize those? Who are the people that helped you seize those opportunities or be able to provide the, the capacity development to people like Aro Yavi. I mean, we've talked about the Kellogg Foundation, uh, the role that Bob Harris played in that. Are there other individuals? Um, I mean, Vernon Young, for example, we haven't talked about very uh, much. Well, first of all, I, I gained a tremendous amount from the ph physicians who came to us with their, with their MDs for scientific training. It had to be pretty... That was at MIT then? Though. At MIT. Pretty mm -hmm. superior person in the first place to get to want to do that and to take calculus <laughs> back at MIT and physical chemistry maybe at MIT, which yeah. is not easy. But uh, a... I'm not going to give you individual names, but right. the, you were one of them, Ricardo Huawei, uh, was uh, uh, a, a key person and so on. And uh, so that, that was uh, the support I got. And even in the building of the United Nations University program, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, physicians, uh, Jean-Pierre Havec, your, uh, yourself, mm -hmm. uh, and Ricardo Huawei, uh, uh, principally. I've obviously been very fortunate in uh, my uh, collaborators and my principal one at MIT was Vernon Young. And uh, Vernon and I had a common interest in protein. Uh, we shared graduate students, shared the um, weekly conference uh, and so forth. Uh, Vernon was very good scientifically, quite disinterested uh, administratively, and we made it, we met a very good team. Yeah. So that that was uh, one. As far as the international activities, uh, Ricardo Huawei mm -hmm. has been the 
uh, he followed me as president of the International Union of Nutrition Sciences, mm -hmm. and now and then as advisor to the rector at UNU. Uh, now he's sort of taken over the global international uh, role. Some of the people who came to me had their own ideas and their own initiative and they needed a chance to work on them. And uh, Susanna Icasa, mm -hmm. uh, building a school of nutrition yeah. and getting the government to build a, a big building for it uh, was, uh, quite an, it was quite an achievement. achievement that's right. And there, there, uh, there are others that so, uh, should be mentioned. Yeah. But what, what role did people like Valyasivi, for example, Valyasivi in, in, in Thailand, uh, oh. other, other oh, well, uh, international figures that, that were in many ways your counterparts in their parts of the uh, world? Oh, um, well, uh, yes. Uh, Ari Valyasivi is a, uh, a good example. He became head of the nutrition department at of uh, the Nutrition Institute in Bangkok, and then he became director of nutrition and FAO until he reached retirement age. Uh, and it uh, was interesting enough, he was a pediatrician, but he had a knack for working with the elderly. Yeah. And uh, they, they just loved him. And he could do metabolic studies with the, with the elderly that uh, nobody else uh, could do. Now, if we start talking about uh, people internationally, uh, we need hours. <laughs> uh, well, now, but, but before we finish then, because there's one more person uh, that I know had been key to your life. You've mentioned her several times, and that's that nutritional anthropologist that you have spent a good portion of your personal and professional life with. Uh, what role did Mary play in, in this remarkable story uh, that you've been, you've been sharing with me? Well, the, That's Mary Scrimshaw, by the way, in case you're... <laughs> uh, well, obviously a tremendously important uh, role, and um, I'll come in a little bit more, sp more specific uh, uh, in a moment. But uh, I read Ruth Benedict's Patterns of Culture and Margaret Mead's growing up in Samoa, Samoa. and I was impressed at the uh, need for, for background cultural information. And I gave it, was giving a talk at, in a, at an AMA meeting in uh, New Jersey, mm -hmm. and I had to stay overnight in New York. I got into New York about uh, four o'clock in the afternoon, and I got the idea of trying to call Margaret Mead. And uh, I got her on the phone and uh, at the American Museum and uh, asked if, if I could come and talk with her. And uh, she said, well, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, I'm, going to be, I'm going to be leaving shortly. Uh, what is it you want to talk about? And I said, I'm going to lead this new institute and I think social science is going to, and anthropology is going to be important, and I'd like to I'd like to talk to you. Uh, she said, "Well, if you'll meet me uh, at my apartment in uh, Greenwich Village, uh, I'll give you half an hour." Uh, in due course, I arrived. After two hours, uh, <laughs> she said, you cook the steak, I'll make the salad. And uh, uh, it was sometime after midnight <laughs> when I left. And uh, anyway, the die was cast that anthropology and social science would be a part of NCAP. Then, I had a very fortunate circumstance, uh, a young anthropologist later president of the National Anthropological Association, had just come from a uh, postdoctoral fellowship in, uh, uh, in Peru. And he came to visit my office and ask if there were any opportunity. Well, of course, he was put to work immediately. <laughs> and that was part of the secret of INCAP. Good people showed up, you gave them a chance. Now, not everyone you gave a chance to, 
uh, of course, turned out to be uh, an Ardagave or a Guzman. But uh, then th that really set the tone for uh, the incorporation of anthropological considerations. Now, uh, independent uh, of that, uh, while I was a medical student, uh, Mary was involved in a program for her PhD in genetics. And uh, unfortunately, she had a miscarriage just near the end, and there wasn't time enough, and so she never, she never got the degree, even though she was at the final stages. And then when we um, uh, got down to Guatemala, uh, she was fascinated by the archaeology and uh, was, uh, took courses at the university in that. Uh, and um, when we got back to, we came, we came to Boston, uh, she enrolled in, of course, in anthropology at uh, Brandeis and uh, uh, again uh, was, one, was one of only, uh, of ten people. She was the only one approved to go on to a PhD that year. And uh, again, there was another miscarriage and Susan had problems and so on. And, uh, but she she didn't get it completed by the time I <clears throat> went down to uh, to Panama, but she had a, obviously had a profound influence on my daughter, who uh, became a uh, medical anthropologist, uh, received the Margaret Mead Prize, the American uh, 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 American Anthropological Association uh, was. Um, uh, associate or assistant director, and then uh, that head of the uh, uh, at, at University of uh, uh, California uh, of the uh, nutrition of the anthropology uh, department, mm -hmm. and so uh, and I told you that she played a seminal role in giving me the idea. Uh, of how to integrate uh, anthropology into nutrition, uh, nutrition surveys. Now, that led uh, to uh, discussing this in, um, with the Ford Foundation uh, representative uh, for the uh, uh, South Pacific, uh, South Asian, uh, countries, mm -hmm. and uh, he had uh, had considerable authority responsibility uh, to the four Ford Foundation funds, and he offered a proposal, uh, offered a grant uh, that uh, we could use to uh, enlist individual anthropologists in a number of countries uh, and uh, assign them to applying the methodology. Well, where did the methodology came, come from? The methodology uh, came independently from my wife, Mary, and from my daughter, Susan, because yes. Susan had been working with Elena Hurtado in, uh, in Guatemala, and they had developed uh, some guidelines for uh, anthropological studies associated with health. Now, it sounds very simple, but it's, yes. but it's really quite profound. What was the anthropological methodology applied? Well, first it was observation. Yes. Uh, uh, second, it was a, uh, and that included <coughs> participant observation. Mm -hmm. uh, and secondly, it was, uh, an interview, not a sociological type of interview with set questions, set answers, but uh, a, a guided, <coughs> open-ended open uh, uh, interview, the kind of thing that, the, that uh, she'd done down on the, on the Finca. And uh, so uh, this uh, 
But <laughs> the way this was started, it just is interesting uh, because Mary was working uh, on doing anthropological work on the plantation mm -hmm. in Guatemala uh, when I got some funds from somewhere to hold a uh, committee meeting in, at WHO. I get, and you, some of it came from WHO uh, to uh, explore uh, social science and nutrition. Well, Mary was on the plantation in Guatemala and she couldn't come and I couldn't bring my uh, I couldn't bring my wife any well, anyway. Uh, Gretel Pelto had worked uh, uh, with Mary, and uh, she was she was free, uh, but she was invited to. No, she was not. She was not invited. Uh, I couldn't invite my wife or pay for my wife from. A, from a fund, mm -hmm. and Mary couldn't come anyway. So Gretel uh, came, mm -hmm. and uh, it was out of this meeting that the concept of uh, what um, uh, the concept evolved, and that uh, was uh, picked up by the Ford Foundation. And the next day, it was a. Uh, a, a workshop in Bellagio, Italy, uh, in the Rockefeller Foundation Conference Center, mm -hmm. uh, with supplementary Ford Foundation funds that carried things on. But it was the this committee meeting in Geneva that had the con concept. Now, the, um, Susan and uh, the uh, Guatemalan uh, anthropologist who had been her student, mm -hmm. uh, had, the, uh, had the guidelines. And so we got to, uh, the, these were uh, developed and, uh, at uh, an early point. There was a uh, initial meeting in Bellagio, as I say. And uh, the interesting th thing there was, uh, first the program had no name, it was simply uh, anthropology applied to nutrition or social science applied uh, to nutrition. Uh, the second thing was that as the discussion went on, and I had realized too from the uh, uh, work of the plantation, that uh, you needed to you needed to put together uh, both. You had to determine what, uh, how the health system was, was working, how the health system related to the individual and the individual to the uh, health system. But uh, it was incomplete because we didn't know uh, what the health system was doing, how, the, how they were behaving and how they were interacting. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was agreed that all of these anthropologists should go back and add the component of, a, uh, of the health center uh, interaction. Uh, it still had no special name. And then uh, there was a final meeting in Sri Lanka. And in Sri Lanka, we did just what we'd done in getting the name for single cell protein or for in Camparina. We put words up on the board and uh, nothing, uh, uh, nothing fitted until uh, we got rapid appraisal, <laughs> and most people interpret it as rapid anthropological. Uh, but at any rate, the name was good, and it stuck. Yeah. So, uh, as a result of this, uh, some of the international agencies began to pick up this methodology and apply it in their programs. So we got a, a grant from UNICEF to have a, a conference in at PAHO, Pan American Health Organization, in Washington. And to our amazement, uh, there were uh, 20, 25 applications of it by World Bank projects and UNICEF projects and so on. And it produced quite a 
a thick volume uh, entitled uh, Rap, uh, which has gone through two editions. Well, you know, as, as, as I reflect, you know, we've, we've talked about accomplishments, about principles, opportunities, support, colleagues. Um, are there, I don't think that it's going to be possible for any of us to summarize a, 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 such a spectacular career in, in 30 seconds or 90 seconds, but it truly has been amazing. Have you got, have we left out anything that, that you want to make sure that, that uh, uh, we return to or has covered most of the, of the key things that, uh, uh, that are important in your career from your well, perspective? Well, I've tried to emphasize the importance of uh, treating people at all levels of quality. And I've tried to emphasize that uh, you you work with you work with people, and people are the same all over the world, yeah. and their basic problems and their basic needs and so on. Uh, you don't need to take uh, or religion or color or anything else yeah, into into account. You just deal with people as people, and as I say, that makes me comfortable in any, in any country in the world, and I think probably makes the people I work with more comfortable as well. well and I'm gonna be bold to add just one more thing, and that is science and the application of improving people's lives. Uh, that science and the application of improving people's lives, uh, which clearly your, 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 uh, your career has, has, uh, has demonstrated. So, thank you.